All right. Good morning, everybody. Who's ready to get your social and digital media groove on? Woo! <laughs> All right, I am Stephanie Geiger. I am the COO and co-founder of Government Marketing University. We are a marketplace that brings together industry and government um, experts to train, develop educational content, and provide networking opportunities for the government marketing community. So both people that are marketing and selling to the US public sector. So I'm super excited today to bring together this great um, panel of experts. We're going to kind of do a panel on panel where um, each of them are going to kind of walk through a couple of different areas of expertise and share some best practices as it relates to digital and social media. So with that, um, we're going to get started here. So first up is Doug Mashkuri, who is the VP and GM of GovLoop. And he's going to talk to us about data privacy and GDPR and what's that um, doing to impact kind of our industry now and what we can all do as marketers to prepare for that. So Doug. Thanks, Debbie. Welcome, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, it was a great start to the... Uh, the, the summit this morning, and I, I think you can hopefully get a lot out of our panel today. Uh, before we really jump into uh, social media uh, tactics, strategies, trends, I wanted to spend a little time talking about just data privacy and, and why data privacy is becoming a bigger and bigger issue and obstacle for all of us in this room. Um, data privacy and some of the regulations that are coming out are really going to impact our sales and marketing efforts going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, so I will jump to it once my slides come back up. All right, so, so why now? Slides are over here. Yes, yeah, <laughs> why now? Why is data privacy so important? Well, if you look at this slide, if you look from the bottom right to the top left, the frequency and scope and scale of data hacks are tremendously increasing. Your data is more vulnerable, your personal data, your professional data is more vulnerable than ever. Um, the public, the general public has had it. Uh, we want some protections. The staggering statistic I, I, I keep reading about is back in 2016, Cambridge Analytica boasted they have 5,000 points of data on every US voter. That's a lot of data. <laughs> Who thinks they even have 5,000 data points? Right. I don't Scary. Know myself, you know? <laughs> but 5,000 data points. And how they're getting it is, is not necessarily underhanded. It's Facebook polls, it's Twitter polls, it's LinkedIn things. So, our data is out there. We are giving this data up, but we're not sure where it's going. But I assure you, it is going places. So this is kind of the urgency we're seeing now, is how do we protect data? Um, there are two recent regulations that have come out in the last two years uh, that are really driving kind of the first wave of how do we take care of user data. The first one is GDPR. It's General Data Protection Resolution. Uh, it's an EU-based uh, uh, initiative. It went effective May 25th, 18. I'm going to go through these quick, we don't have a lot of time, so if you have questions, talk to me after. The basis of this is you don't have to be an EU company to be compliant. If you have EU users in your database, uh, you have to be compliant. What does that mean? If you collect or process any data of EU residents, you need to be compliant. Uh, penalties are severe. It can be up to 4% of company revenue or 20 million euros. Uh, what the rights in GDPR are giving back to the user is access to the data. You can ask any organization what data they have on you, how are they using it. Uh, you can request it be deleted. You can request it be moved. You can be informed on how they're using the data. And most importantly, there's accountability for companies. It's not just saying, yes, I got your request, I removed it. It now has to be documented. It has to be an infrastructure built around it, and you have liability around it. So that was May 2018. Coming very quickly, January 1st, it's coming to the United States. Uh, the California Consumer Protection Act, also known as CCPA. Uh, this is based for California residents. Uh, effective January 1st. Once again, to be, uh, uh, if you have to be compliant, there's a couple factors your company has to meet. You either have to have revenue over 25 million, you have to, uh, or collect data of over 50,000 California consumers, or 50% of your revenue comes from California data. If you meet any of those criteria, you have to be compliant. The penalties there, once again, $750, dollars per person per violation. Uh, that can end up quick. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the rights around this? Similar to GDPR, um, you have to be able to prove access and provide access to your data. You have to show if a consumer asks you if you meet this criteria, you have to show them what, you, what data you have on them, how you're using it, uh, you have to give them the right to opt out. Um, you have to show them what's been collected. Your privacy policy has to reflect your intended use of that data. 
If you're saying you're using it for one thing, and you start using it for something else, the fines are coming. Um, you also have to, and this is a gray area that they're still figuring out, there's a provision that you still have to provide equal service or price uh, for folks that aren't giving you their data. This is a very gray area because if that's the only source of income for a company, they can't still be providing services if they're not getting compensated for it. There will be a lot of legislation around this and a lot of looking into it. But the point I'm trying to make here is these are regulations in the last two years, started in the EU, has come to California, um, and it's coming. And it's gonna come uh, fast at us. So why does this matter? Uh, this is a consumer movement. Um, we have so much data out there. We're seeing these breaches. We're seeing the potential liabilities and vulnerabilities we have both personally and professionally. Um, the amount of data we produce every day is a lot. It's creating more problems for companies and individuals. The volume of hacks is creating more problems. Um, the majority of companies, I guarantee everyone in this room, we all process data in some capacity, whether it's for a sales and marketing database, whether it's a customer database, we are all in this together now. Um, this is forcing <coughs> companies to not just build a better privacy policy, it's to build an infrastructure to protect personal data. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of these regulations are forcing, and not just saying, oh, you can opt out. You have to have a mechanism that's easier for people to opt out. You have to have an infrastructure in place of reporting and accountability for audits. You are gonna get fined if you're not compliant. So there are really uh, transforming companies it's not just a legal problem, it is a company problem. You need legal, you need IT, you need marketing, you need sales, uh, all focused together on how we're gonna protect data that we're collecting. Um, there's financial penalties, but more importantly, uh, to me, it's the negative press. Anytime you read about a hack, that is a PR nightmare. That is a sales nightmare, that is a marketing nightmare. Um, how do you defend that, you know, the two million person database you, you have uh, has been hacked and that information is out there? Uh, perception's reality. Even if you don't have to be compliant by the letter of the law, you probably still want to look to being compliant. Um, so what are, what are, what, what's the expected impact of this? So the experts are saying, you know, this isn't, solution's not coming out of the box. You're not going to buy something and all of a sudden you're compliant. It's really looking at your systems, your operations, your methods of data collection, your methods of data storage. Um, you know, from an email marketing and, and email sales, you know, we have to understand the process. We have to know where data is, how it's being stored, how it's being used, and document it. Um, experts are saying, get ahead of it. Be transparent with your, with your, uh, with your, your end users about it. Um, you can make this a selling point. Like, we take security seriously. We take personal data security seriously. In our sales and marketing efforts, we want to protect your data. We're using it for the right things. Um, you know, longer term, as this really kind of sweeps across our country, the bad stewards of data are gonna be much more noticeable. So you can really differentiate your organization as being compliant, as protecting data. Um, you know, the compliance rules are out there now. We have a new one coming in January for California. Um, already Microsoft has announced that they're gonna apply the CCPA uh, um, criteria to all their, their efforts in protecting data. You can expect this to come across the country quick there probably will be at some point a national level uh, data privacy and data protection regulation. So it's something to think about now. Um, the worst thing that can happen is we as companies aren't thinking about it. Um, it goes to legal, legal will shut things down. It's the mm -hmm. safest thing. It keeps them off the front page of the Washington Post. It's safe, but think about from our sales efforts. If we can't access data, um, we can't contact prospects, <coughs> we can't do email marketing we can't communicate as much as we want with our sales prospects to drive our business. So that's what the experts say. Here's what I say, the non-expert. Um, I said, sorry, treat these regulations like nationwide programs. Uh, get corporate counsel involved soon uh, so they can see it and look how we do it. We as sales professionals, we need to rethink how and what we do with our leads. Um, how we're storing that data, how we're reaching out to them, are we compliant? Um, our users are now empowered to hold us accountable as organizations. And that means you might be doing the right thing, but others in your organization are not. We are now all accountable to this, and it's very visible. Um, you know, I think it's reimagining our marketing and sales strategies a little bit. Uh, you know, how do we work outside of email? How do we work outside of 
going to our databases? Is there more thought leadership and awareness? Getting out to events like this to talk more. Um, your reputation and transparency matter in all of this. Um, once again, you might be doing the right things, but you really have to make sure organization-wide we're doing the right things to manage these, these regulations that are coming through. And then once again, I, I think in the end, being compliant and being on top of this, this movement that's coming, it's a great way to create a trusted brand status that you are compliant. You're taking data privacy seriously. Um, you know, think about it. In all our databases, we probably have how many government people in those databases? Uh, we want to show government that we're doing the right things. We're protecting their information. We're doing the right things with it. That's going to elevate you to a new level of trust, which really should equate to you know, better reputation, better sales process, and just more transparency in general. So I went through a lot. We don't have a lot of time. I'm more than happy to talk after if you want a lot more specifics. I have a much longer presentation where I can give you more information, but I really wanted to give you a, a high level. Um, this is addressable. This can really expedite our sales process and, and trust and brand. Um, we just have to be aware of it and really kind of work through what, what we want to do as organizations. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, I think we're seeing this already a lot in our industry. You know, you see that through cookies, pop-ups that are happening on websites. You get double opt-ins for some of your email campaigns now or when you register for events. So it's, it's happening already in this yeah. space. And I think that a lot of us that might have, um, you know, we're part of a larger commercial company. We've seen some of those regulations where maybe we rolled our eyes when legal's asking as we're, you know, sending out email campaigns or something that there's these lengthy things that we're asking government customers to opt into. But it's, it's happening and it's coming. And I think that... Um, as we look at our smaller businesses and our marketing teams and really trying to prepare for that and make sure that um, you know, we're setting ourselves up for success to be that trusted brand and to make sure that we're aligning ourselves with that data privacy. Okay. Um, all right, so I think this is actually kind of a, a nice segue because um, you know, as Doug mentioned, there's gonna be a lot more pressure, I think, also on some of the third-party vendors that we leverage in some of our campaigns to do a little bit more of that upfront legwork and um, making sure that as we're engaging with government customers um, and making sure that we're able to get in front of them, that we're finding creative ways to do that. They might be a little bit outside of um, the GDPR and still being able to kind of create that, that leadership, that branding opportunity. And so um, Aaron Heffron, who's the president of Market Connections, is gonna kind of walk us through what the day in the life of a, a federal worker looks like and what their social media is is social media usage looks like and maybe the ways that we can kind of engage with them and be more prominent through that journey. Thanks, Stephanie. So, all right, I'll keep going and we'll see what happens. So, the, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, listening to Doug talk about uh, the data protection and such, and it really came to a head a couple years back and we can thank our friends at you know, Facebook and other those stores for really bringing that out into the forefront. I think that the blessing and the curse of, of Facebook uh, really taking it, taking it on the chin from that uh, was one that you know, raised the awareness and you've got these other rules really meant to protect uh, the consumers of that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, Facebook and the other social media players did take a hit on it. But they did not really seem to take a long term. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of concern three years ago ish uh, that. Am I not on? There we go. You just got to bang it a little bit. I'm like Fonzie up here. Just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that got that reference, um, we'll, um, you know, we'll meet out at the uh, soda stream here in a little bit. Um, so it's, it's back to no working again, so we didn't hear me fine. So I tend to, pro tend to project a little bit. Uh, so we had to thank, about three years ago, I think the concern was is that uh, social media was going to really take a hit, that everybody was going to bail out of Facebook cancel their accounts, run screaming from it, uh, and really have a concern over any sort of social media. And I think there was a little bit of a industry comeuppance that was, you know, everybody thought was coming. Well, kind of like when they started posting the nutrition information at fast food restaurants, uh, and you saw all of a sudden saw how, you know, not so good the taco at Taco Bell was for you, 
uh, that it took a short-term hit. People stopped going to Taco Bell for a little bit, but then people realized, hey, I kind of like Taco Bell, <laughs> and it's Still 2 a.m., there's nothing better than a taco and a Mountain Dew uh, <laughs> that go. So that's what, uh, so they started coming back, and that's kind of the same thing we saw with Facebook and some of those others. In our research, we saw that some of the government folks said, yes, I'm canceling my and getting out of my Facebook feed, my and Twitter feeds and such like that because of concerns, but it was a very small percentage. And most of what everybody did was went in, checked their privacy settings, maybe made a tweak here and there to them, and then forgot all about it and went about their day uh, because they like what the social media provided to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, we all forget that we provide a lot of data about ourselves out there um, even when we check through the grocery store and in order to save 25 cents on chicken breasts, we give a lot of our data over to the grocery store and all their co uh, companies just to save that because that's the trade-off. So we as marketers and sales really like to leverage the social media because you know, there's a lot, a lot to it. And it's a, it provides a good access to individuals at all times of the day. So what I wanna walk through uh, is research and information that we've just gathered over the past couple months that walks through the day of an individual and the types of media that they uh, are exposed to. And we're all exposed to a ton of media uh, throughout the day, and I'll take a quick walk through the day, uh, is that you know those federal folks that we're trying to target, they wake up in the morning, uh, many of you roll over and either you're woken up by your clock alarm, hearing the radio, or your phone buzzes uh, and your thing wakes you up in the morning and you roll over and you look at it. And the first thing you look at is have so many texts come in that I need to know what are some of those email newsletters that hit at 6 a.m. every morning um, that I can read. Or you look in social media and say, what did I miss overnight uh, that was going to be posted and what may be coming up to the day? So there's a lot of media. You may flip on the TV. Uh, when it's going on in the morning, that's going on at the same time. And we actually found that the TV is the most frequently used media first thing in the morning. Moving on to your morning commute, you're a captive audience, uh, generally, to the radio. AM, FM, still top of the list, followed by satellite radio. You're listening to those. All during the time, there's still a number of other resources that you're accessing and hitting you. You get to work. It's digital. You're not listening to AM, FM anymore. Many times you're locked in buildings, you can't get a good signal, or it's disruptive to those that are around you to have the radio playing uh, as you go, even if you have headphones on. And what we find is that's when the digital media starts to come into play. Uh, you're reading those digital publications and whatnot. Uh, lunchtime, you hit, there's a jump back on social media. Social media, if you're gonna do during the day, social media peaks at lunchtime, and then again in the evening, and we'll get to that. But you see the ups and downs of it through the day, and I'll show you that a little bit more in a second. Uh, as you continue your evening commute home, you're still on the radio, you may listen to podcasts at that time. Uh, radio listenership's a little bit down during the evening, but then you get home at night, and it's a media extravaganza uh, <laughs> that hits you. At that point, it is video, whether you're streaming it or watching TV, uh, it is social media, all those sorts of things start to, start to budge. So social media, though, plays a role throughout your day. And as we see, as you go through the day, these are the percentage of individuals who are accessing their social media at different points of the day. And you can see the spikes. A little bit higher in the morning, goes down during the commute, a little bit during the work day. Spikes again at lunchtime. If you are looking at a social media campaign, when do you want it to hit? When they're most likely to be on there? Lunchtime they're hitting, uh, and then after work. Um, for better or for worse, you know, that's when social media is at its highest point. Now you may say, well, this is business related stuff. Do they really want to see that in their personal feeds? Um, you know, all of us, I've started seeing more and more work-related ads now in my personal social media feeds. I think many of you others have had, especially if you're using devices 
that serve both purposes, where you're doing both work and personal work from those. They're starting to cross-pollinate each other, and you see those things come up. The other thing I want to note is that you know, a lot of question about the federal audience is about access of their personal devices and social media during the day. Um, I think there is the perception that the federal worker walks into their workplace and social media and personal devices go away. Uh, we found that only about 25% of the individuals have to actually set their personal device aside uh, when they walk in, either leave it in their car or check it in as they go in. Uh, there are still a large number, though, who do have access to their personal devices during the day, um, especially in the civilian audiences. Um, that's way up, and they're using it during the day. Um, don't be, you know, don't think that they don't access that during the day because it is a good vehicle to get to them. Because they are accessing and spending a good bit of time, so some of that time has to be during the day. Uh, we see that there's about a third of the individuals out there that are spending more than 15 minutes a day on social media. This is the federal audience. These are the people that you are trying to sell to. So if you want to get to them, uh, one of the ways to do it is through these devices, through these channels as we go along. And what channels are they? For better or for worse, the federal audience is old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's the reality of it. You know, we tend to, as marketers, and if you've ever been in consumer marketing and doing any consumer marketing, you're like, oh, we've got the 18 to 35 crew or the 18 to 24s. You know, these are the spenders. Well, when we gather a lot of data on the federal buyers and the federal audience out there, you know where our age cut has to happen? Where do you think our age cut is? Just give me, a, give me an age where you think it's kind of the middle ground. 55. Mm -hmm. So if you are under 55 in the federal audience, you are considered young. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that, yes, that it, makes, it makes some people in our office happy. It makes some of us feel a little sad um, when you hit certain thresholds. But it's 55. So that's old in social media land. But that's why you see Facebook as where it is, because Facebook is old in social media language. Um, nobody you know, under the age of 35 really considers Facebook their go-to social media platform. They may have it just because they want to be connected to their parents uh, is where it ends up being uh, going. But there is still a huge audience there. And day-to-day -day usage of Facebook is very high. You know, they're hitting this every day. 40% of them report daily use of Facebook. LinkedIn is still there. It's an older crowd. It's a professional crowd. Uh, but the LinkedIn usage may not be as frequent. It's there, but uh, it's not as frequent. We find that having to reach them on LinkedIn requires a great deal of persistence uh, because they aren't necessarily going there you know, minute by minute as they do in some of the other social media platforms. Instagram and Twitter have seen an increase in the past uh, three to four years. Uh, we have seen some, and I have a lack of word for this, youngening, youthening of the federal audience because of retirements. Mm -hmm. uh, the last two years have seen some of the highest level of retirements ever in the federal workforce. That has in turn made the average age of the workforce go down uh, to some extent. Now it's gone down by like two to three years. We're not talking a generational change quite yet in that, but what you're finding is some of the younger audiences do have uh, a desire and a presence on Instagram. We do see uh, Twitter. Twitter increased a lot over the last two to three years. I have no idea why anybody would be on Twitter um, <laughs> now or why that would grow. Um, I think the, the current administration has led to a push and growth in the use of Twitter uh, in, its, uh, in its communication methods along the way. So many of you probably use these platforms to get to folks out there. They, and I want to kind of paint a little bit of a picture of those. If you use Facebook as a platform to try to push out there, and I will preview is that we've got a, a, a webinar coming up here uh, in a couple weeks that is focusing on the social media side of things and really answering the question, 
do people really want to see this work-related ads on their personal feeds, or does it just tick them off, and they you know, start to say, you know what, that's kind of creepy. I don't need to see that, and I don't want to see that anymore. Uh, but for right now, if you're using Facebook, what's your audience look like? It's not surprising your audience. The federal Facebook audience is older. Um, you know, nearly half of them are 55 and over. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Twitter, the age starts to go down a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit younger, but still the greatest percentage of individuals in that audience will be 55 and older. Um, Instagram is a younger group. Um, again, I don't think that surprises. That's the audience that is uh, you know, newer into the federal space, although there is still, you know, you've got half of them are under the age of 45. Um, in that audience. And then LinkedIn, professional networking uh, information there, again, that older crowd. You may say, that's great, older, younger. Um, tell me the civilian defense break. Facebook, I'm out there, it's gonna be a more of a civilian crowd mm -hmm. uh, if you're using them to reach individuals. Twitter kind of breaks even between those. Um, Instagram breaks even between those. Um, I think the Instagram crowd, uh, you've got a lot of younger folks in the defense agency, enlisted folks that are uh, speaking to that, that are mm -hmm. going to lean that way. And then LinkedIn is going to be more of a civilian audience again. Okay, great. Show me their level. That's what you really want to know. You want to know, I want to reach these certain individuals. You know, they're all in that 13 to 15 GS level, you know, across all of them. I don't think that's... I mean, that's where a bulk of the folks are uh, that are, are doing this. But look at those SES levels, the highest levels there. Where are they? They're not necessarily on Facebook, not, definitely not on Instagram um, in there. Um, half of them probably couldn't spell Instagram uh, along the way. <laughs> but uh, the Twitter uh, presence is much higher there. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to be able to reach those individuals a little bit more on Twitter, much more so than the GS 11s and below. Now, I say that it's important, though, and we talk about it, is that the influence in that crowd is important to be both up and down the GS levels. There. Um, you need another mic. Is this my third mic? Mm -hmm. All right. We'll try this one now. The uh, you'll see the where I was there. I uh, wanted to market across those audiences there because it's great to be able to reach that top level audience, which is nice to make sure they're aware of who you are, what you may be doing, what your company uh, may be putting out there. But you want to have familiarity across the other levels mm -hmm. so that when they're making a choice, especially if you're not a company with the highest level of brand awareness in the space, you may be a little bit of a risk for an agency uh, you're new to the space, uh, you're going to want to make sure you're well spread out in the lower levels as well so that when they make a decision, uh, they don't get the who when they announce who they're going with from everybody in there. <laughs> also, these lower, the lower levels are the ones that are uh, down selecting. They're choosing the final two or three uh, that are going. So you want to make sure you're reaching out to those individuals well, make sure they have that f level of familiarity uh, with you as you go along. So as I mentioned, we have more in-depth information that's going to be coming out on social media here in about two weeks. Uh, you can actually, I'm told, take a picture of that QR code and it will jump you to the registration page uh, for that if you're interested in the webinar. But we're going to get into a little bit more of the detail. What are they going to social media for? Um, there is a good bit of information uh, that we're going to be talking about is you know, what kind of content are they looking to get from it and why are they on social media? Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of a preview is that we do see a significant number of, you know, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the individuals actually seeking out work-related content even on what we find to be those traditional personal social media. So they see your ad on Facebook because you've redirected to them. Uh, there is a likelihood they're actually going to click on it and go through it. Uh, the younger audience especially, we have found there is a blurring between the personal and the professional life that they may be doing personal for a little while, 10 minutes there, jump over to some work stuff because it's interesting, jump back, and there's a constant toggling back and forth between the personal and the professional 
as we go along. So having that presence is not necessarily a non-starter, especially for that younger audience. So happy to answer questions on that, but I will pass it along to Mark. Thank you, Aaron. So I think uh, two of the biggest takeaways I have from that is one, diversify your social media plan, right? So make sure that you're visible on the various platforms. You can use it as an opportunity for a little bit of A-B testing, maybe on some of the messaging based on the various platforms. And then two is humanizing your marketing, right? So uh, we just had our GAIN conference uh, last week, last week, and uh, we talked a lot about the customer journey and how Gavis are just like us, right? So you watch them kind of go through that day-to-day uh, phases of their commute and the different things that they're doing and that's similar to what you're doing. So think about that and kind of put them in your mindset while you're coming up with those messages or where you're touching them in those various platforms um, and coming up with your marketing. So, okay. Next is kind of our uh, social media secret weapon over here. So Mark is going to talk to us uh, with our uh, 15 LinkedIn tips in 15 minutes. So Mark Amtower is the uh, managing partner of Amtower and company, and uh, he is like the jujitsu for uh, how to get through LinkedIn and make sure that your messaging is uh, prevalent and uh, using it in the best way in order to be effective. So, Mark? Here we go. All right, 15 tips and tactics, 15 minutes. Um, I will email the slides to anybody that wants them, so if you want to take pictures, go right ahead. If you want me to mail them to you, just shoot me an email. 630 plus million members of LinkedIn worldwide 177 million in the U.S. Of that, 2.3 million right now are feds, identifiable by agency and operating division. My next federal census of LinkedIn will be out late this year, early next year. Uh, and according to HubSpot, LinkedIn is the number one spot for sharing B2B, obviously, including B2G content. So before engaging, first five tips here are on your, your profile. If you want people to engage, there has to be some information there to engage with. You've got to entice people. So use that background area, that silly blue with the dots and line. You know, that says nothing. That is the best advertising space on LinkedIn, and it's free. You can use your company logo, a graphic that emphasizes your skill area, whatever, but use it. Uh, no fish, no cats. Uh, headshot, <laughs> business tire, smiling. <laughs> Headline, what you do and who you do it for. Nobody cares about your job title, uh, except you. Uh, and maybe your boss, who knows. They're, you're, you're looking for their title anyway. The summary, now called the about section. This is your story. What do you do, who do you do it for? And if, you're, if you like what you do, tell them why you do it. Tell a story, get them engaged. Uh, for your experience, each job listing on LinkedIn needs three, at least three things. I'm really tired of seeing profiles that do not explain this. What the company does, who they do it for, and what your role is. That's not brain surgery, but get it done. So if your profile is not optimized, it, basically it's irrelevant. People aren't going to look. And I, I don't mean to pick on people here, um, but you know, We've all seen the profiles where a guy puts a new job or a woman puts a new job on her profile. You think it's new, you send them congratulations. Turns out it's like nine months ago that they moved. Get a grip. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you know John Weil or not. I know him. I'm not connecting to him because his profile sucks. Um, <laughs> what, what's here? He's the chief executive <laughs> officer at ITAC. Um, what's it at? Well, I know what it is, but nobody else does, right? So, no picture, no background photo, no explanation. If you scroll down, there is nothing that says what IT-AAC is or does. Kevin DeSanto, on the other hand, shares ex immediately who he is, what he does. He's an investment banker involved in defense, aerospace, and government contracting. Hello. If you need, am I, kid, am I dead? I don't care. You're good. Okay, good. I, yeah, I'm loud enough to cover this room and several others. Um, but there's no doubt about what Kevin does. And if you have any doubt, his about is his entire personal history. Everything he has done since he left college is investment banking focused on these three primary areas, defense, aerospace, GovCon. Not bad. And he's really good at it. He'll be on my show next month. Um, social selling tactics, first five. Find, produce, and or share 
pertinent content, content that's relevant to the audience that you serve. No cat videos or kumbaya crap, okay? I don't need motivational stuff here. I've got a ton of, of motivational tapes if I want to listen to them, and I do, but not on LinkedIn. Uh, follow the agencies or the integrators that you want to do business with or that you are already doing business with. Click the follow button. Identify and follow key personnel in those organizations. See what groups they belong to. If you go to scroll to the bottom, if you share groups with them, you can click on the uh, shared groups and it'll list the groups that you share with them. Those are important because there's liable to be similar people in those groups and you can scroll the members there so you can look for more contacts. Monitor the posts of influencers. This is why you want to follow them because it'll show up in your information feed. It'll show up on your home page and it'll show up on your notification page. I want to know what those people are doing. I want to know what they're thinking. I want to be able to share it before anybody else does. That keeps me on your radar. So, uh, and I'm not doing this to suck up to Emix. I'm a fan of Government Sales Insider. It's got great stuff regularly, and I love to read it. I love to share it. I want to be the first person out there sharing it in my network, in my groups. Wash Tech, same thing. New stuff all the time. What do they talk about? Our market, the IT market in the federal government. That's all they talk about. Uh, Alan has an article in there. Just went up yesterday. Raise your hand, Alan, say hello. Um, it, it's a great article. If you want to defend your, your budget to management, this, this is must-read stuff. Um, so let's go to DISA. They got over, what is that, 4,000 some odd people. It's really tiny type here. I hope you can see it better than me. Uh, so they got 4,000 plus people on LinkedIn. Hmm, yawn. Uh, but if you click on that, you've got this top nav bar. You can, uh, you can see uh, the locations. I use the all filters because I want to know specific things for the companies I work with. So what do I do? I scroll, I click on all filters. This is the top screen. If you scroll down a little bit, you get to search. If you, knew, if you know somebody's name, you can search by name. But I'm searching for job function areas. So I plug in cloud and I come up with, actually, this number was somewhat higher on a different search. But you're coming up with people involved in cloud. Okay? So, Learn to use that, that all filters thing when you're looking at specific companies. Filter it down to specific job functions. Uh, I was talking to a uh, trade show producer yesterday because I got a notice from him that he's got this show coming up on a specific area. And I said, uh, you know, call me when you have two minutes. And he called and I said, you know, you on LinkedIn? He said, yeah. I said, go to Deloitte. And he did. And I said, click on the employees. And he did. And I said, click on the all filters. And he did. And I said, plug in what your next show is about. So he wrote in eDiscovery. And he came up with like 30 people at Deloitte that he did not know. Did not know. Deloitte sponsors some of his stuff. Hello, this is Neat Toy. I don't care if it's low on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about 30% of 2.3 million, we're still talking about 750,000 people. Mm -hmm. yep. That's not bad. So uh, you want to follow somebody, you see the little more button across from uh, the message, you click on the more and you follow. Oh, I also did his, his mutual groups. Let's go back here, Mark. So we have three mutual groups. There's only gonna, they're going to show you one or two, but I want to know all of the groups that we share. So. Five more social selling tactics and we're getting really close to being done. Monitoring of the notifications. You have the notifications page so you know what's going on in your network. This is not Facebook. You're only connecting with people who are involved in what you do. People who can help you, who can influence you, who you can influence. So following them, uh, the notifications can be extremely important. 
I, I hit the notifications page every day. I say happy birthday to just about everybody, and I congratulate people on job functions and job changes. I also look at their profiles before they do this because I want to see where they are in my network, where they are in my food chain. I will personalize this till it bores you to tears if I think I have a hot lead here. So I'm not just going to say happy birthday and go away. Endorse and recommend. Uh, monitor your homepage feed as well. Uh, have your sales, marketing, and BD staff and your subject matter experts engage. They have to engage here. So be active and stay on the radar. Uh, encouraging people to act. So I, uh, a happy birthday notice, sorry. It's hard to read here. Uh, so uh, I, I know Jamal sort of passingly, but well enough to say, hey, happy birthday, man. Uh, are you going to go to the summit? So he, I didn't know about this, but now I'm going. So I hope he's here somewhere. Maybe not in this room. Maybe you're learning something elsewhere. If I get him here and I'm responsible and he's happy, I'm going to email him tomorrow and say, hey, did you go and did you like it? I'm going to remind him that it was me who told him to come. So my buddy Gail, is my buddy Gail in the room or did she leave? She left. Well, tell her I was trying to make her embarrassed. But uh, so if I want to recommend Gail, and I already have, I click on that more button, I go down and highlighted, you see in blue, is the recommend. Recommend is what you can do to write something about somebody. I've given out probably close to 400 recommendations. I've been a solo consultant in this market for 35 years. There's a lot of people who've helped me along the way, and I like to acknowledge those contributions, preferably before they die, because I hate writing eulogies. Um, so I see something in my feed the other day, and this is really, this is cool, because 13 women f CEOs form the first cohort at VA of WSOBs. This is pretty neat news, okay? So, but if you see the, the little uh, tag on the bottom where somebody's name is there, if you click on that tag, oh, you didn't include the new slide, ah. Uh, I clicked on that and everybody here is tagged. Everybody here is tagged. So I was able to go, I have four first degrees in this cohort. So I posted back saying, congratulations, I tagged each one of them back, I got six responses, I got two meetings out of that, okay? This stuff works. I'm well within my time limit. <laughs> I like when that happens. You're not done yet. Uh, I'm not? Uh, all right, so minor levity here. Uh, Jimmy here would like to add you to his professional network on LinkedIn. Uh, there's one I have of a Trojan horse joining too. So the, the thing here is to vet before you connect. Make sure the person you have is viable, make sure they fit, make sure they're friggin' real. Thank you for attending our session. Thanks, Mark. I am there. Thank you. So I think that, uh, I know personally, I find it annoying when people try to connect with me and then they immediately try to sell me something. So I think that um, one of the you know, main takeaways, and I think all these tricks and tips that Mark has shared will hopefully help you as you're building out your brand on LinkedIn and helping your company to do so as well. And you know, don't just self-promote, right? Deliver content that's going to be relevant for people as you're out there and make it part of your daily practice every morning, you know, looking through your feed and finding things to comment or share. Um, finding the agencies that you're targeting and those influencers to start driving connections that way I think is just really important. And I'm always um, incredibly impressed and stunned by that number of feds that are on LinkedIn. So it's a, it's a great use of your time and an opportunity to really make an impact. So thank you all. At this point, we'll take some questions. Um, if anybody has any, Alan. I have a question that um, is maybe a um, a little bit of a takeoff from where you guys are going, but I know everybody on the panel probably has um, has an opinion on it. When it uh, gated content, so you're using social media, you're using email, you're driving people to a landing page, you're driving them into a place where you're, there's content. What is your philosophy, and what have you seen from a research perspective about what you should gate and what you should not gate? I I'll take it first and pass it down this way, where stats are behind me. Uh, I say leave your initial content ungated, because if you start off with gated content, 
your audience is going to drop off precipitously immediately. Um, once you get them coming back, when you have longer, more detailed stuff, then you can put a gate up. Yeah, I would say that uh, there are different levels of gates, and that's one way to kind of think about it, is that you know, you're basically asking them to trade some information. It's back to this point right here. You trade some information to get something. Um, so you, you judge, what do I want? Just an email address? Okay, maybe that's one level. Next level down, you know, a little bit more about you and what position you are. So I think you can kind of stage it out a little bit. Um, you know, you don't want to give everything away for free um, because, you know, there's something to it. But um, I tend to lean toward the gate less, you know, hide more, or no, gate more, Gate, gate less, no more. Less, hide more. <laughs> no. Hide less. Yeah. Gate le yeah. yeah. Gate less, give more. There's what I'm going for. <laughs> yeah. um, so yes, that uh, and just kind of do it in stages. Acknowledge it because there is something to you know. It's kind of like having a conference. If you don't charge people to attend, uh, they're more likely not to show. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of all, everything free doesn't have any real value to them. So if, if I have to give something up, hey, it might, must be worth something. Um, to go. Yeah, and just to echo that, I, I think it's about building trust, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If your first interaction is give me seven fields of data, and then it's not a good experience. So it, build trust. If you're talking about something and want to drive people, I would drive them there ungated. Mm -hmm. And then if you want more in-depth and you've built that brand loyalty, then you can ask for it. Yeah. yeah, I think also now with retargeting ads, right? I mean, you can retarget them after they've come to your website and downloaded without the gating, and so you can retarget for other content that you want to capture that information for. Hello. Um, with Twitter recently banning political ads, do you feel like that's going to have an impact spillover into government or other industries or other social media sites? No, no. Bar Barack Obama actually used LinkedIn in his first run. Uh, and when he did, I'm wondering, who the hell is this guy? Uh, I found out. Um, but it was pretty cool. Are, are, is it going to impact? You know, it's, they're going to use Twitter anyway. It may not be advertising, but there's going to be a lot of crap on there about this, this upcoming election cycle. My feeling on the Twitter thing is that it's uh, is more of positioning by Twitter uh, to do a little preempted CYA mm -hmm. um, than it was anything that's going to have an actual appreciable impact on that. I think what they're trying to do is take away a little bit of the call to action um, that's in there. There's going to be a fine line of what is political and what's not. They're already you know, getting pushback and arguments about, okay, this is political, this isn't political, and eventually they're gonna throw up their hands and say, look, we can't judge this, this is, you know, there's too much here, and, you know, they wanna be a platform. I mean, and Facebook has made that argument forever that, look, we are a, plat we're trying to be an agnostic platform now. You know, that's gotten them to where they are, um, in some cases, but I've, I have a feeling it was a little more of a political stand, frankly, a little bit of a PR stand yeah. from a Twitter standpoint, than it is going to have any appreciable impact. Yeah, I, have nothing, I agree. I mean, the PR, obviously, and ironically, a political movement, uh, a statement to kind of differentiate between the platforms that are out there. I, thanks everybody for doing this. Um, when sending a note on LinkedIn and you go up to uh, you know, connect with people and go to their profile, what are the important elements you want to put in that first email? It's like a cold call, so to, to make it simple enough but give enough information to uh, get them to perhaps send their email so you can take you, a You mean to connect with them or to message them? No, when you connect in, in, a, in a cold call connect, if you will. Um, I, I like to get on people's radar by following them first. When you follow somebody, they are alerted that you're following them. If you're going to cold out of the blue, ask them to connect, give them a valid reason. Mm -hmm. So put it in context. Um, you know, I've been doing business with your agency, I've been doing business with your company, I'm involved in this technology. Uh, this is not a sales call. Uh, I got a connection request this morning, 
and, and it immediately started. Can I help you with your video? We should connect. Well, I have a YouTube page, jerk. Uh, do a little research. Um, it sucks, but I have one. No, it doesn't suck. Um, so you know, put it in context. Yep. I agree with that. Yeah. I think, again, it just goes back to that humanizing, right? How would you want to receive a message? And you know, who do you connect with? And how do you kind of uh, evaluate those connections? So putting those key points in there to make it interesting and um, you know, wanting to show value. Any other questions? All right, well, I thank the panel so much for their uh, insights and tips, and thank you, everybody. Thank you.